This is the lecture for um, European history for Wednesday, the 15th of December, 2021. Please make sure you have your notes out and your uniform code obeyed. And uh, where we begin is something I forgot to tell you yesterday. <laughs> Georges Danton. <laughs> boldness, boldness, and more boldness, and Le Patrie will be saved. Danton is not quite extreme enough for Robespierre. And so during the height of the Great Terror, Robespierre declares that Danton, who's his chief rival, is a traitor. And so Danton is put on a show trial. The man who saved the revolution by raising an army to fight at the Battle of Balmy. And um, he is beheaded by guillotine. Danton's last words were, My only regret is that I'm going before that rat, Robespierre. <laughs> and he was right that Robespierre would soon be joining him in the chop chop land of the guillotine. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. So, um, you have the list of unit two vocab. On, on the end of it, is that like what's going to be on the test? It's something you should know. Okay, cool. What's going to be on the test is what I've lectured. What does that mean? Everything <laughs> I've done since we started talking about <laughs> Unit 2. Every word you have a question? Why? Because I'm a history oh, teacher. Is it going to be matching or multiple choice like we had in last week? Live in anticipation of the future. Anticipation is sad. Prescience <laughs> is a dead end. If you ever read the book Dune, or see the movie, first and second part, when they make the second part, you will know how much of a horrible dead end knowledge of the future is. So all I can say to you is, if you want to understand the future, look to the past. Yes, last okay. question for now. Okay, I have two, one thing. Dune is such a great game. I love that game. Also, um, if there's a game and it's fun, you have to like push on it and the ball goes, it's great. Um, so, and then, Dune? <laughs> yes, it's not Dune! It's I great. Um, I know no, it's, it's not, not, but it's a great game. And then another question. Then you what is it sand floor that pops up? Yes! It's like, it's like sand. It's like sand. Okay. It's like a ball that goes... Whoosh. Okay. Yeah, it's it's all related to the um, Well, obviously, if it's sand worm, there's some Disney. relationship. Obviously related. What? Haley, I have things to do so today. To remember. Oh, yeah. The extra credit thing, that's due after break, right? Not due by Friday. The extra credit thing is due by Friday. Uh, why? What extra because credit? I don't want to deal with it after vacation. So if you want to do an extra credit essay or presentation. No, uh, not that. The, the movie thing that you said was extra credit. Oh, no, that's any time. Okay. Oh. Uh, obviously, though, the movie thing will be useful during the uh, study for your test because it is a good study of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and it covers a lot of what I cover. But it's a different way of getting it, so it might help the information stick better to your mind. So, uh, yeah, I did. I did suggest a movie. Uh, it's one we normally see in class, but this year it's just been. I've had to compress. Yes. When can we do the presentation? Anytime between now and Friday during study lab. Okay. So if you have a presentation ready and you want to do it tomorrow or Friday, just come by and I'll give you a pass. You can use this for your, if you have your uh, presentation projection thing on Google Drive. You can sign it in and you'll have it available. Can we just say the stuff on our presentation, or are we supposed to have no cards? Of like no, you're, you can say, you you can have. Your job is to teach the class. I'm not fetishistic about you remembering everything. I don't speak from notes. Even when I do public speaking, I don't speak from notes. Uh, occasionally, I'll have like five, a list of five things that I want to cover. But uh, I don't expect other people to do that. What I want you to do in your presentation, whether it's on video or in uh, live, is I want you to tell people something worth hearing in a way that will help them know it about your topic. I don't want you reading because that's dead. As a performance art, reading something aloud is not really great. But if you can talk about it and you have your notes, not a problem. Yes? I thought, so the essays now do before break? Yeah. I had been saying that all along. I had been saying that. That's not my problem! Maddie? It's just kind of ours. So then, do we get our case study back then? You'll get your case study back when I'm done correcting them. Okay, okay Maddie, what do you need? I need my case study to do the essay. You have a whole pile. Can I help you unload them? If you want 
Come by during lunch today and you can photograph your case study, which I haven't graded yet. And uh, that way you can have your cake and eat it too. Okay. Thank you. And I, that's an offer for anyone. So, um, now we go back to actual teaching. Uh, not that that wasn't important. Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte has defeated the British at Toulon by being capable of reading a situation and instead of doing the expected thing, the normal thing, the frontal assault thing, Napoleon jujitsus the British out of Toulon by taking the one critical point that the British can't retake. With all of his forces, he takes these coastal fortifications, and in doing so, it puts his forces in a position to shell the British fleet in harbor. The British try and fail to retake them because the entire French force is protecting this one spot, and the British have to pull out and leave. Because Napoleon understands the ground, he has a great sense of the ground, which any land commander needs, and he also has a great sense of the psychology of his enemies and his subordinates. He can read the psychology of his opponents by the way they deploy their troops. Alexander the Great could do the same thing. And he could inspire fanatical loyalty in his followers. And Alexander the Great could do the same thing. So, Napoleon comes back to Paris during the time of the Directory as a hero. The Directory is happy with him, but like any government of non-charismatic bureaucrats, they, um, they begin to suspect that this general who serves them now might at some point become a threat to their power. But they're not that worried about him yet. Or maybe they are. They make him the Commandant of Paris. So Napoleon is now the commander of the military garrison in the center of the revolution. Maybe it's a situation of keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And the Paris mob rears its ugly head again during more food riots. Yep, the revolution still has not solved the problem of the food supply. And that's a big problem. But they're dealing with Napoleon now. So Napoleon mobilizes the garrison of Paris. The people are rioting in a public square. Napoleon marches his troops along one edge of the square and has them form ranks. Who's this trumped up little soldier in his fancy schmancy uniform? He thinks the troops are going to fire on the people of Paris, they say. Napoleon orders the crowd. Parisians, disperse! Go home! The government will deal with the problem. But this demonstration is over. You have one minute. Obviously, if they showed signs of dispersing, you give them a little more time. But the crowd gets belligerent. Who do you think you are, you fancy little soldier, you soldier boy, you little marching doll, you nutcracker? No. And the crowd surges towards fire! <sighs> Napoleon not only orders his musketeers to shoot into the crowd, he has a series of small cannons called carronades loaded with grape shot. Grape shot turns a cannon into a giant shotgun, dispersing pellets in a cone in front of it. It's a good crowd control weapon if you don't mind killing the crowd. The mob is shocked. It breaks, and the Paris mob doesn't really appear again until the Paris Commune of 1870. So Napoleon kills one side of the revolution, this fearsome mob that rises from time to time and seizes control of events. By firing, quote, a whiff of grape shot, he saves 
the revolutionary government. Tsar Nicholas I, who I'll talk about at the beginning of next unit of Russia, who's later than this, looks back and says, if only Louis XVI had had the vision of Napoleon to give a whiff of grape shot to the members who, fought, who, who swore the tennis court oath. Whereas what Nicholas wanted was order and peace, and what the French Revolution promised was the exact opposite. Revolution, and maybe utopia, but certainly war. So, the Paris mob is put paid to. Napoleon is actually even more popular, because the thing about the Paris mob is it scared everyone. It scared the radicals. It scared the people of Paris. You could be a Parisian that loves the revolution, but if you have a bunch of wild men running through your streets, killing wantonly and burning randomly, you could get caught in the crossfire. There comes a point where human beings have a choice. If they are forced to choose between totalitarianism, which is an authoritarian police state and ultimate tyranny, or anarchy, which is just constant roiling chaos, again and again, people choose order over chaos, even if that order is tyrannical and oppressive. Mussolini may have done horrible things to Italy, but he made the trains run on time. The scary thing is how history would have looked at Adolf Hitler had he died in the summer of 1939 before World War II began. Because a lot of Germans liked what he did. Bring pride back, bring order back, employ people. So the revolution is actually, and again, my communist college professors hated this about Napoleon, is actually saved because Napoleon takes this out-of-control thing, this Paris mob that has been looming like a nightmare over the revolution since its inception, and um, disperses it, dispels it, exercises it like a priest exercises a demon. Now the, rep the directory is afraid of Napoleon. This man has uh, glory, he has victory, and he has the Paris garrison loyal to him. So nobody is happier than the rulers of France when Napoleon says, uh, you know, we have problems on our southeastern border. The Swiss and the Italians are giving us trouble. Let me take this care of this problem for you. And the directory says, yes, please, take an army. Conquer Switzerland, conquer Italy. And so Napoleon leaves Paris, whew, says the directory. And Napoleon is the last foreign conqueror to conquer Switzerland, and he then marches south into Italy and conquers Italy. After conquering Italy in the 1890s, Napoleon thinks upon his situation, and he thinks about himself, not in terms of Alexander the Great, but in terms of Gaius Julius Caesar the great dictator who uh, tried to end the Roman Republic and replace it with his rule and was assassinated for it. Julius Caesar was a Roman who won military fame and converted that to political power. He marched from Italy to what is now France, conquered it, conquered Gaul. Napoleon, after conquering Italy, is voted a consul of the Republic. So the directory is shifting to a two-man system of rule where you have two consuls, a first and a second consul. And Napoleon becomes a consul. But thinking about Caesar, what does Caesar do after conquering Gaul and before becoming dictator for life? Which didn't turn out to be very long. Uh, what, what, where, hmm, where does Caesar go? Any of you remember? Yeah. Well, before Rome. Between between conquering Gaul, yeah, he does march into Rome, but at, uh, before he really settles in Rome, he goes somewhere else, somewhere exotic. Egypt. He goes to Egypt, yes, indeed. And in Egypt, he has uh, a rug presented to him in the middle of the night, and it says it's unrolled. Beautiful young Cleopatra is there to seduce him, and while she wasn't the most classically pretty uh, queen, she was a Greek queen, and she had studied how to seduce and rule men through the sensual arts from the storied courtesans of the East. In any case, she became his honey. 
and Caesar had many adventures in Egypt before coming back to Rome. Napoleon says, yeah, I want to do that. So again, the people who've been running the revolution in Napoleon's absence are happy because Napoleon's going even farther away than Italy. <clears throat> Napoleon crosses the Mediterranean, lands in Egypt, and uh, at the Battle of the Pyramids defeats the, uh, the Kedi, which is the Turkish governor's forces, and some British forces that were there to help, and Napoleon takes over Egypt briefly. Napoleon does not get a hot Egyptian queen. But he does get that behind Ryland. A flag. At the village of Rosetta, French troops unearth a stella, S-T-E-L-E, -E, which is a, uh, a proclamation stone from the Middle East. But this stella has something special. You see, up until this point, Everyone who knew anything about Egypt, and there were a lot of people interested, because it is exciting and exotic, knew that Egyptian walls and objects were covered with these odd symbols called hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs, hieratic, and so forth. But nobody could read them. They were a mystery. They, was, uh, they were as mystery to, uh, mysterious to them as the Etruscan language or the... Um, oh, gosh. The languages of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro are to us. We don't understand them. But at Rosetta, Napoleon's soldiers dig up a stone, of which that is a reproduction. And that stone has the same proclamation in three languages. The languages are hieratic, which is a later form of hieroglyphs. Dematic, which is sort of an intermediary transitory tongue and Greek. Now, nobody understood hieratic, not really demotic either, but Greek, that's the language of the New Testament. Everyone who's educated knows a little Greek. If you know the name of any dinosaur, you know a little Greek. So we have a key now, a proverbial Rosetta stone that will help us understand possibly the language of ancient Egypt. So like every conqueror of Egypt, Napoleon brings his treasure home with him. Seventy years later, a guy named Champollion, a French scholar and adventurer, archaeologist, in Paris figures out the beginning of the solution. I am not going to make an accurate one because I honestly don't remember. But say you've got an Egyptian symbol... Sort of a dog faced god and face. But it's inside of an oval or a square. That oval or square that surrounds these images looks like a unicorn. That oval or square that surrounds these images is called a cartouche. Champollion intuits that a cartouche must represent a proper name. That is the breakthrough. By assuming that anything inside of an oval is a proper name, Champollion can begin to crypt cryptologically decode and make assumptions. When you're starting to translate a language nobody's ever translated before, <clears throat> you have to start with working assumptions. His working assumptions is Cartouche's are proper names, and he turns out to be right. And with this breakthrough, Champollion leads us to a point where today, human beings, three, four, five thousand years later in some cases, can actually read the languages carved into the stone at the order of the ancient pharaohs. Which is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that is thanks to Napoleon's troops digging it up at, um, at Rosetta. However, geographically, there's a reality that Napoleon has, um, well, de-emphasized in his thoughts is a fair way of putting it. Here is Egypt. Here is France. Here is French Italy. Here is the French Empire so far. What's between Egypt and the French territories? Yeah. Raise your hand if you, if you know. What geographical feature is between Egypt and the uh, French territories? Yes. 
The Mediterranean. The Mediterranean. And what, what type of geography is the Mediterranean? What is it? Water. It's a sea of water. Salt water, in fact. Now, there's something you ought to know. At this time, Britannia rules the waves. Now, that means that Britain's Royal Navy controls the Mediterranean Sea. Now, controlling the sea doesn't mean that enemy ships don't get through from time to time. After all, Napoleon was able to bring himself and his army to Egypt. But Admiral Horatio Nelson at the Battle of the Nile defeats the French forces and forces Napoleon to withdraw back from Egypt to France. Still, he has some of that Caesarian glory. Conquers Italy, conquers Egypt. Ah, what a guy. And when Napoleon gets back to France, it's time. He is first consul of the empire, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the French Republic, sorry, and he takes power into his hands. And at this point, the directory, uh, voluntarily, the last vestiges of the directory goes away, and his junior consuls do whatever the heck he says. So, Napoleon is the master of France. Now, by this point, France is the master of Switzerland, of Italy, of the Low Countries, that's Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg, parts of Western Germany. But the Austrians and the Prussians and the Russians and the British are still fighting him. So Napoleon launches a series of attacks with his grand army. Now, how is Napoleon so superior to everyone? Well, it's not simply a matter of himself as an individual. Here's a term for you. Levé en masse. Levé en masse. Levé en masse. Before this time, in the Seven Years' War, say, armies are relatively small in Europe but incredibly highly trained. These guys can operate you know, combined arms, they can work together, they can maneuver precisely. I'm talking all of the royal armies of Europe were relatively small forces, but incredibly well-trained, well-equipped. When the French Revolution happens, the French Revolution uh, says, hey, everyday Frenchmen, it's your patriotic duty to step up and serve your country in time of war. So you must do it. As a result, France suddenly has a large army. Now, at first, the size of the army didn't matter because they were lousy troops. These are the guys that ran whenever the Germans under the Duke of Brunswick fired on them. They were revolutionary guards. They were not soldiers. But in the 1890s, what Napoleon is able to do to his parts of the French army, and then the rest of the French army, is take the largest army in Europe at a time, except the Russians, at a time when France had the biggest population in Europe, except the Russians and turn that army into a really effective fighting force. So with the levee en masse, which is the draft, which is how they recruit or compel huge numbers of Frenchmen to join the military, it's the draft. The levee en masse is the draft. If we, God forbid, end up getting into a land war in Europe or Asia, the likelihood is we're going to need to draft people. And uh, all of you young men have to sign up for the draft at 18. I don't know, maybe the feminists have succeeded in getting women to sign up too. That's possible. I really haven't kept up with it because I'm old. If we get into a war, it's your duty to go if called. You may not want to go to war. Then become a conscientious objector. We have laws that allow people who are pacifists and who never want to hurt or kill another soul to do their duty. You go through your training, you become a medic, or you take on another job that is there for conscientious objectors. You don't have to go into battle and kill people. 
you have to do a more risky job. You have to go out to battlefields and heal people. Your people and the enemy. I have no problem. In fact, I admire those people who in American wars uh, serve as conscientious objectors. I don't agree with them. I am not a pacifist. But they do their duty. The people I have despicable, uh, des I despise are the draft dodgers. Those people who break the law, benefit from our citizenship, and don't, don't do their duty. Back in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of them that went to Canada to avoid serving their country in wartime. President Carter, one of the reasons uh, why I have a special feeling for President Carter in my heart, he pardoned them, let these people come back to the United States. Many of them did, some of them stayed in Canada. I don't understand that. So one of the parts of Rousseau's social contract says that in a society that's free, where you have citizenship, you owe that society service if it's needed. And service in war is one of those things. So the Levé en masse is about service in war, and it creates this massive army for France. And Napoleon Bonaparte, with his talents as a military leader, turns it not only into the largest fighting force west of Russia, but the most effective fighting force, man for man, on the continent, on land. On land. So Napoleon marches into Central Europe, and it battles like Jena and Austerlitz, takes the Austrians and the Prussians and crushes them. I mean, I, I don't mean to, I mean he crushes them. Okay, the, the, the Prussians, the, the modern Sparta, crushed at Jena. Uh, the Austrians at Austerlitz, crushed. So Napoleon, in the early 1800s, takes over this vast territory of Central Europe. Napoleon actually restores Poland for a while as a French ally. Austria, Prussia, during the mid 1800s, uh, early, you know, from 1800 to 1810, uh, they all everything west of Russia comes under Napoleon's rule. Everything west of Russia, northwest of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, even Spain and Portugal come under. Uh, well, Spain comes under uh, French rule. <laughs> so Napoleon's military genius is is manifest. He is the master of Europe. Britain and Russia elude him, just like they elude Hitler in the 1940s. Britain is over the English Channel, which is not a calm bit of water. The English Channel is actually filled with strong currents and eddies and storms, and it's not easy to cross. Otherwise, England would be conquered a lot more than it is in history. And there are no aircraft, so if you don't control the waves, you don't really get to move things across them. Russia is this massive behemoth to the east, and in terms of consolidating his power, in 1807 or 8, 1808, I think it is, at a river town called Tilst in East Prussia, a barge is built in the center of a river. And the Emperor of the French and the Tsar of the Russias meet on this barge on the border between Prussia, which is under French rule at this point, indirectly, and Russia. And the two emperors concoct uh, the Peace of Tilst. And the Peace of Tilst basically is a risk game agreement. Russia is confirmed under imperial rule of the Romanovs. And Europe is confirmed under the rule of Napoleon and his uh, agents. Russia agrees not to interfere in Europe. Napoleon agrees not to interfere in Russia. They divide the world. So after the Peace of Tilst, the only people fighting Napoleon is, are the British. Now, the British are secure because in 1805, the Battle of Trafalgar is fought. Let's look at the Battle of Trafalgar. So, the battleship, or the um, heavy warship, 
of the time is called a ship of the line. It's a sailing vessel with many, many, many sails, wooden hull, and several rows of cannon on either side. Typical ship of the line has 150 to 200 cannon split between their port and their starboard side. So unlike a fighter plane today, which attacks forward, its guns face forward, a naval warship of that time moves but attacks to its left or its right, to its port or to its starboard. So to unmask the main battery of a ship of the line, you have to turn to the side. So naval battles traditionally are between forces of warships in line ahead formation that are both going can you catch and toss it please thank you that are both going in the same direction blasting at one another until one side gives the British tend to aim at the hulls to try to sink enemy ships. The French tend to aim at the masts and sails to try to uh, disable the ships and later capture them. So this is the rule of naval warfare. The captains of each ship have very little authority. They have to maintain their place in the formation and fire on the enemy when ordered. That's their job. Now, the Franco-Spanish fleet has combined. It's much larger than the British Royal Navy. So the British and the Franco-Spanish fleet chase each other all over the North Atlantic, from European waters to Caribbean waters back again. The British finally catch up with this much larger enemy at uh, Cape Trafalgar, which is just off the coast of Cadiz, Spain. So the Spanish coast of North Africa, oh, I'm sorry, the Spanish coast on the Atlantic just south and east of Portugal. And the French, they're planning a typical naval battle. They line up, and the Spanish are behind them. And it goes back. The British, under Lord Nelson, Britain's in maritime power. It's a naval power. It's comfortable at sea. The French and the Spanish are good at sea, but they're not as good as the Brits, because the Franco-Spanish also have the land to worry about. And what Nelson's going to do is he's going to take the rule book, book of fighting a naval battle and throw it out. What Nelson is going to do is, yeah, there's the British line, but he's going to order the British line to actually break through the Franco-Spanish line. This is insane in some respects, because what that means is the Franco-Spanish ships are going to be firing at the Brits, and the Brits who have turned towards the Franco-Spanish forces won't be able to shoot back except for a few isolated frontal cannon. Logically, this is a suicidal maneuver, and the French and Spanish absolutely don't expect it. Please let me finish, and I'll take your comment. But Nelson gambles that the British, who encourage initiative among their captains, can handle this suddenly fluid situation better than the rigid Franco-Spanish captains, who are desperate to obey the, their admiral's orders. Plus, if it works, if he breaks the Franco-Spanish line, his ships can fire in both directions. But that's not all. The French ability to command is going to be broken. And if the Admiral's ship is anywhere near the point of penetration, the Admiral will lose control of his fleet. And the fleet will not function properly because no one is able to assume command in place of the Admiral. The British will use skill to defeat Franco-Spanish numbers and initiative. What was your, yes? Well, I did Admiral Nelson for my case study, and when he kind of rose to be actually in command of multiple ships and 
fleets. His philosophy on warfare shifted from the traditional, we're just going to sail in two lines, kind of far away from each other and shoot at each other. His whole thing was he wanted to get in close and draw them into that melee because he knows or he knew that the British gun gunnery crews were far superior to any other nation that he'd be fighting at the time. Indeed. And then his, just to kind of correct the number of guns you say that a ship of the line has, HMS Victory, I believe, was his flagship, which is actually a museum now. In yes, it is. It's still there. Yeah. In fact, you're, if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll play you yeah. a, a broadside of it. Yeah, I think, though, at the time that the number of guns was a little less, because HMS Victory, I believe, was a second rate with only 96 guns. Yeah. But a first rate had, first had as many rate. as up to 150. Yes. First yeah. rates did have a considerable amount more. Yeah. In any event, so this is what happens at Trafalgar. Thank you. And again, you rock. Your historical knowledge is quite impressive. And that's not me being condescending. That's me recognizing the quality. So Nelson leads his forces into the, 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 the maelstrom of Franco-Spanish fire, and he breaks the line. His forces destroy a number of French ships and Spanish ships, but more than that, his fleet remains a single fighting force with a common goal. The French and Spanish descend into chaos. Now, Nelson himself is killed by sharpshooters from a nearby French ship. He is shot in the middle of the battle. He dies a day later, but from the Cape Trafalgar battle, nobody is going to seriously challenge British naval dominance until the Battle of Jutland in 1916 in World War I, and the Germans who try are going to fail. It really isn't until the rise of the U.S. Navy uh, between the wars and the Japanese Navy and the U.S. Navy in World War II that are going to give Britain problems. And the truth is the invention of the aircraft is going to confusticate British sea power anyway. But this secures dominance for Britain over the seas of the world, which is going to be a huge deal in Unit 3. So Battle of Cape Trafalgar is a huge deal. Admiral Horatio Nelson is responsible for it. So Napoleon controls the land. In fact, in the, I think it's 1804, maybe 1805, Napoleon is so satisfied with his control over Europe west of Russia and east of Portugal and Britain that uh, he's going to have a big celebration. He invites everyone, including the captive Pope. Now, the Pope at the time was captured and brutalized by the French forces. I mean, he was brutalized a la brainwashing, brutalized. The Pope's mind was stretched and snapped and broken to an extent. So the Pope is invited to come to this ceremony as a passive witness. And this is sort of a travesty caricature of Charlemagne in the year 800. Because what Napoleon is gathering the world for, the, no, the leaders of his world, is he's no longer, first consul is, is an insufficient glory for him and for France. The French Republic is going to be replaced by the French Empire. And he will be the emperor of the French. But unlike Charlemagne, who kneels as the Pope goes through the coronation ritual on Christmas Day of the year 800. The Pope sits as a mute witness as Napoleon takes the crown because no one else in the room is fit to crown him except himself. He has made this happen. He crowns himself. And there's this famous picture by Jacques-Louis David of Napoleon crowning himself while his wife kneels in front of him and the Pope sits there mute and the crowned heads of Europe that now work for Napoleon are looking by in admiration and a little fear. So Napoleon is the master of Europe. Undisputed. Except for Britain. The Treaty of Tilst is going to um, is going to uh, legitimize this. So, how does Napoleon rule? Well, first of all, you can take the boy out of Corsica, but you can't take the Corsica out of the boy. Napoleon understands the only people he can really trust are his blood relatives. So he does things like put his brother Joe, Joe Bonaparte, Joseph Bonaparte, becomes king of Spain. Now, 
Joe Bonaparte is somewhat incompetent and kind of stupid. Why put Joe in charge of a country? Why? I, I could go on. Why? Yeah. Why? Let's go, Brandon. Why put Joseph Bonaparte in charge of France? It's so horrible. Um, here's why. Because Joe understands what time, what side of the kitty litter has the plastic on. In other words, Joseph Bonaparte knows that he would be nothing without his brother Napoleon. And so Joseph Bonaparte, in thought, word, and deed, is going to serve the interests of Napoleon, his brother, to hell with Spain, to hell with himself. Napoleon's needs always come first. And Joseph Bonaparte will never, ever, ever betray Napoleon. Because Joseph Bonaparte owes everything to his brother. This is called nepotism, which is a vocab word. And what nepotism is, is when you hire in unqualified family members because they'll be loyal. That's nepotism. When you hire or promote unqualified family members because they'll be loyal. When you hire or promote unqualified family members because they will be loyal. So Joseph Bonaparte, like many other relatives of Napoleon, becomes a crowned head of Europe because they are trustworthy and they will never betray Napoleon, period. I think what I'm going to do is leave it there. Which means tomorrow's lecture is going to include some summary of all of this. And what I will do now is show you, what was I going to show you? I was going to show you the broadside of HMS Victory. What is it? Um, how many questions do you get in the mail test? A bunch. No, let me be more precise. Like A whole lot. Like 120? <laughs> Good question. Like 121? Good question. <laughs> Let me get the lights, please. Sir, please. I'm not telling you. You told me last time. Because I was having a moment of sentimentality, I guess. Because that means I could send all of this to be good on it. The amount of questions is really bad. What? The amount of questions is really bad. The amount of questions is not a problem. Because if it's 121 questions, and this is all I need to study, it will be less than 500. You're not helping. <laughs> <laughs> the no, freaking demon. Stop. I'm not talking to you. Okay. You're talking to somebody. So this is actual the actual flagship of, of Horatio Nelson, and it's going to uh, conduct a broadside, which is firing the cannons. have smokeless powder. So battlefield Side as you fire volley all at once. And it has the same principle as land warfare in those days, which is you get a number, as many barrels as possible down uh, aiming at the enemy, and you fire them en masse, and hopefully some of them will hit. 
Um, next time, remind me if I can, I'll be playing for you the song of uh, Le Marseillais, which is the French Revolutionary Anthem, and Rule Britannia, which is the great anthem of Britain during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, that's it. Firefox. That's so good. Ah, I'm an old fashioned guy. I remember when Firefox was the new thing that was challenging Microsoft Explorer. Lights, please.